Fantastic. Uh, we are starting pretty much on the dot. Do you guys want to give it another minute or so for people to arrive? Yeah, I think we can do that. Maybe in the meantime, you could uh, you could introduce yourself, Ahmed. What should people know about you? Yeah, so uh, my name is Ahmed Gapoor. Um, I am the general counsel of Noom Technologies. Uh, I'm also a professor of law at Boston University School of Law in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, let's see, I uh, obviously am a lawyer, so I went to law school. But before I went to law school, I was an engineer. Um, and I worked on actually uh, distributed systems, not decentralized systems, uh, basically supercomputers, super uh, or sort of cluster computing when that was sort of uh, a thing that that uh, um, came out uh, to replace these like single system vector machines. Um, and uh, at some point, I went to law school, uh, graduated from law school and then entered uh, the world of human rights. Um, I represented uh, 40 something Guantanamo prisoners at some point. Um, and then I moved from uh, doing that to uh, doing criminal cases uh, in the United States with a focus on, uh, you know, uh, computer crimes and uh, sort of national security crimes, including espionage and the like. Um, and it was there that I think I got a, a good sort of knowledge base uh, on uh, many aspects of uh, electronic surveillance and foreign intelligence, uh, stuff like that. Um, at some point, I started a clinic uh, at the University of Texas in Austin, uh, or a project within a clinic to address uh, sort of a gap in criminal cases where you got really great lawyers uh, that didn't know much about tech and therefore we're not able to uh you know uh, uh, um, provide the best counsel i guess for their clients uh and so uh, i launched a clinic at texas to sort of provide support uh for those defense lawyers and later i launched another one at uh university of california hastings now i think for officially university of california san francisco um and that clinic uh was more focused on liberty and security and technology. Uh, there, uh, we represented, um, we worked on the Ross Ulbricht case, the Silk Road case, we worked on uh, Chelsea's case, Chelsea Manning's case. Um, in Texas, I represented this guy, Barrett Brown, who was uh, an alleged spokesperson of Anonymous. Um, over time, uh, I uh, decided to go into academia. And uh, once there, I realized I really didn't want to be an academic, um, and I really belonged in the world doing things. And fortunately, uh, NIM um, at that point had become a company uh, and uh, was looking for, uh, was basically a perfect fit, uh, at least in my view, until they hired this guy, Sudo. Uh, yeah, I know, I, know I, I, I tend to poop parties. No longer a perfect that. fit, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's where we're at right now. He's but, um, He's, he absolutely loves me. I'm not at all kidding. I'm actually filling out a human resources uh, complaint right now. Just kidding. That was a joke. Love Maybe Sudo. you can do that after the after The only the reason I can't fill you. out the complaint is because I don't know your name. Can you believe that? Like, I can't tell anybody who it is that is, is problematic. I, I am, just have to, like, point to that guy. I'm, 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 I'm pseudonymous online. Get mm -hmm. it? Pseudonym. Pseudonym. Yeah. King of the double entendre. Right. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So if, by the way, um, uh, to our audience, we've shared the community call episode, which um, uh, which we had a, a conversation with Ahmed in about just these topics that he quickly glanced through. So if you guys are interested uh, in this guy for some reason, for some unknown reason, then make sure to listen to that one as well. And Ahmed, I think without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so um, as I told uh, Sudo uh, when I was invited to give this lecture um, last week, um, it's the topic of electronic surveillance is probably best uh, sort of conveyed over a series of maybe 10 to 20 uh, one-hour sessions, right? So what I'm going to do today is provide a very top level overview 
of electronic surveillance, um, mostly definitions, uh, some laws. Um, I might or I plan to also talk about um, the impact of technology on privacy in the context of electronic surveillance. Um, and if we have time, uh, slash if I have um, signal and uh, energy, maybe we will move on to the impact of uh, e-commerce uh, or yeah, e-commerce writ large uh, on uh, privacy um, and uh, maybe even security. Um, and uh, I will discuss, uh, uh, of course, the difference between what was it, cookies and uh, and metadata, uh, which is something that I think someone asked. So I will go over what metadata is and what cookies are at some point uh, in, in that in that uh, in the lecture. Um, okay, so um, what is electronic surveillance? So. I'm going to now describe electronic surveillance, and uh, I will talk about some of the tools involved uh, and the primary objectives of electronic surveillance, at least for the purpose of my discussion. Um, so when most people think about electronic surveillance, uh, they think about uh, spies, uh, maybe James Bond and the sort of secretive gathering of intelligence. Uh, oftentimes, of course, electronic surveillance takes on other forms. Uh, maybe a private detective surveilling a cheating partner, uh, or a company that surveils employees at work, uh, hint, hint, pseudo, using, using hidden cameras or microphones, um, other types of sensory devices to, uh, with the aim of uncovering acts of uh, misappropriation, uh, unauthorized use of equipment, and so on, right? Um, of course, electronic surveillance regarding these activities that I've just mentioned are not illegal, at least here in the United States. Uh, although many would consider these types of surveillance uh, to be a, uh, a, a pretty uh, serious violation of personal privacy. Um, cool, okay, so kind of stepping out of that and asking what electronic surveillance is, um, we can define electronic surveillance, um, at least for the purposes of this lecture, um, as the act of recording, uh, observing, listening to others in real time with or without their knowledge. It is something that typically uh, is conducted secretively and doesn't interfere with the individual's uh, normal day-to-day -day activities. And uh, the surveillance activity typically covers one or more individuals. Um, and the folks that are conducting the surveillance um, also involve one or more individuals that are uh, observing, documenting, um, and uh, recording uh, another's actions using technology, right? So we've got surveillance that can occur using a camera, long-range microphone, listening devices, uh, as well as monitoring, you know, your, your uh, cell phone, um, uh, your home phone services, your office phone services, uh, email, and so on, right? Um, now, law enforcement and government agencies use electronic surveillance to collect information uh, with the primary objective of identifying and preventing criminal activity or security threats, right? So basically, very broadly, electronic surveillance, when, for, when used by the government, is the collection of information with the aim of identifying and preventing criminal activity um, or other security um, violations. On the other hand, personal uh, um, uh, security and the protection of pri privacy, uh, excuse me, personal security and the protection of property are the primary reasons that, for example, a large uh, corporation might employ electronic surveillance techniques uh, against their employees and against uh, members of the public. Um, notably, uh, you know, you may you might have read about uh, Apple hiring former uh, U.S. intelligence ops and Israeli intelligence ops to conduct their uh, sort of in-house intelligence gathering and security, uh, and that's all about you know very very sensitive IP. Um, in either case, of course, surveillance is a pretty effective tool. Uh, for uh, crime prevention, 
uh, identifying potential acts of espionage, theft, property damage, and so on. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, the act of surveilling others is thought to be uh, a nonviolent alternative to uh, many law enforcement or security apparatus actions, right? So, and, it, and this is actually traces back from the idea of the nation state. So the idea is you got two countries right next to each other. They spy on each other. Uh, and the reason they spy on each other is so that they don't have to go to war. Right. So they don't have to go to war over based uh, unnecessarily based on uncertainty, uh, based on a lack of information, et cetera. Right. Um, and then that then that idea of knowing information about others uh, and being able to respond proportionately to accurate information um, then kind of permeates into the world of national security and the world of law enforcement as well. Um, all right, let's talk about some of the uh, main sort of uh, methodologies or instruments of surveillance uh, in modern times, or I, I would even call this sort of conventional surveillance mechanisms as opposed to the super modern ones uh, that we can discuss in another setting, like law enforcement hacking and stuff like that. So the, conven the, the conventional tools of surveillance in modern times um, include... Uh, um, um, wiretapping. So wiretapping um, can be defined as uh, connecting. Um, okay, let me let me do this better. Uh, so wiretapping can be defined as um, wires um, connected internally to a target's communication device. such as, for example, a phone enabling real-time monitoring and recording. So basically, wiretapping, you might think, well, how do we do this on a cell phone, right? But initially, wiretapping, the, uh, the, in, the, the sort of legal uh, device or instrument of wiretapping involved connecting wires, um, either internally to the target's communication device um, or uh, through a centralized actor like the phone company, um, in a manner so that you can enable real-time monitoring and recording. Um, bugging, which is different than wiretapping, uh, requires the uh, planting uh, a small device on a person or in a strategic location in a manner that enables individuals uh, to listen in, to copy, and to record real-time conversations. Along with wiretapping and bugging, uh, there is a, a term called pen register. And a pen register is a device that is placed on a telephone line. Uh, and it is used to identify the phone numbers of the calls made from the surveilled phone. Right? So a pen register is something you put on the line that tells you who that phone account is calling. Um, a trap and trace device is a device that's planned on, uh, placed on the telephone line and used to identify not the phone calls that are made from that line, but the ones that are dialed into the phone number. So if we were putting a pen register on Sudo's phone, it would tell us everyone he's calling, right? So we know that Sudo calls his mom at least three times a day. He's a very good uh, son. Um, and so we would find out that he's that number three times a day, right? And of course, we know that he gets about 13 calls from the pseudonym fan club, right, per day. And so that trap and trace device would tell us uh, the actual phone numbers of the 13 calls that he got from his fan club. Um, so, so far, we've covered wiretapping, we've covered bugging, we've covered pen registers, and we've covered trap and trace devices. Um, of course, uh, I also mentioned photographic surveillance, right? The uh, use of visual equipment. Uh, and this includes, of course, stuff like CCTV, closed circuit television. But it also includes digital cameras in various sizes placed um, anywhere. Um, and it also includes uh, devices that are not owned by the government, owned by individuals like your ring, uh, your Amazon ring, not yours, hopefully, but the ones that are hanging outside of people's homes. Um, and that we will find out maybe not today, but at some point, 
uh, how uh, the information that's collected by private entities, ah, yeah, I guess we will cover it today, uh, it can wind up in law enforcement's hands. Cool. So we've mentioned wiretapping and bugging and pen registers and photographic surveillance, uh, trap and trace devices. And uh, one more uh, uh, sort of device uh, of surveillance is the, uh, the agent or informer. And you might be thinking, what does the agent or informer have to do with electronic surveillance? Uh, and the, what they have to do with electronic surveillance is that the agent or informer typically wears a wire, right? Um, so the, a, the wired agent or informer, uh, that device or that sort of um, instrumentality of surveillance would involve planting uh, or uh, um, um, planting some sort of listening device or recording device on a person um, and placing that person to engage in conversation with other individuals. Cool. So between the very conventional uh, sort of instruments that we've just covered, wiretapping, bugging, pen registers, trap and trace devices, photographic surveillance, and wired agents and informers, uh, we can analogize and sort of uh, break open into uh, the world of modern uh, electronic surveillance uh, in, a, in, a, in a connected uh, digital world. Uh, but primarily, when we think about the law and stuff like that, uh, it, it, it we're going to find that most of the regulations and most of the, the functionalities uh, can sort of fit on top of these uh, conventional tools. Um, speaking of the law, one might wonder, is performing electronic surveillance illegal? Um, and that really depends, right, as an answer. Uh, it depends which legal framework we're talking about. Um, but you can say, you can generalize and say when done properly, um, electronic surveillance is legal. That's sort of like saying when done legally, electronic surveillance is legal, right? So we haven't really gone much, uh, haven't really expanded your knowledge base on that basis, right? But um, to kind of drill in a little bit more, maybe we can say, or we can definitely say that, um, you know, agencies uh, that are employing specific surveillance methods have to follow specific regulations that govern how, when, and where that surveillance may be conducted. Cool? So basically, if there's an agency, and I will just make that very broad, that agency can be a private agency, could be a government agency, right? If that agency uh, or that agent, that entity, is employing a certain surveillance method, uh, it typically has to adhere to certain uh, specific rules and regulations about how, when, and where that surveillance can be conducted. Cool. Um, and additionally, there are laws uh, that typically uh, uh, control how the collected information can be used and under what conditions. So there's at least two tiers here, right? So the one is like when you're conducting the surveillance, the agent that is conducting the surveillance has to employ certain, uh, uh, depending on the method of surveillance, has to adhere to certain law uh, and regulation. Um, and after that, the, the information is collected, after the surveillance itself is, is performed, uh, there may be further limitations on what you can do with the information. Um, cool. Now, um, what laws might exist that regulate surveillance activities, right? Um, the laws, let's start first with, uh, well, most of this is going to be U.S. centric uh, because um, I am, uh, my, my legal sort of uh, education is based in U.S. law. And that is where my expertise on sort of uh, privacy or the lack thereof uh, stems from. But I, I think most countries, uh, at least most Western democracies, have some sort of framework that follows what I'm about to uh, sort of convey. Um, and so I'm going to go through a number of uh, laws or very basic legal frameworks um, and tell you how they uh, describe to you essentially how they either enable or protect uh, individuals, sorry, enable or uh, uh, prohibit uh, um, electronic surveillance. Cool? All right, so starting with the constitution, so the law here is the Constitution, constitutional law. 
And uh, the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution was written to protect people's rights against unreasonable search and seizure. It was like pretty big uh, sort of legal framework, but it all stems from the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution and the scope at which it protects people's rights against an unreasonable search and seizure. Now, if we were in class, right, in fact, there is a whole class in law schools that is dedicated primarily to the Fourth Amendment, and that is called criminal procedure. Most, pe most of what people do in criminal procedure is learn about search and seizure law, uh, whether or not an intrusion by the government is initially considered a search. If it is, then whether that search is reasonable, what makes a search reasonable, typically a warrant supported by probable cause. Uh, in an affidavit before a neutral magistrate is what makes a, uh, a, a search uh, 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 reasonable. Uh, in some occasions, uh, there is an exception to obtaining a warrant, uh, and that those searches are also deemed reasonable. Um, and uh, yet again, in some other cases uh, that don't fall under an exception um, and that require a, a warrant in most cases uh, might be thought of as reasonable um, based on uh, the um, the good faith of the officer conducting the search. We can get into that in detail. It's a very sort of nuanced case. Uh, but primarily, to summarize, under constitutional law, right, uh, the Fourth Amendment, the U.S. Constitution, protects people's rights against unreasonable search and seizure. Um, in the United States, there's a number of legislative acts um, that are important to the... To, control of uh, collection and use of uh, 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 electronic information. Um, the primary uh, legislative act uh, that um, is responsible for regulating wiretap activity, wiretap activity is uh, Title III of the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968. That's a really long term. People just call it Title III or the Wiretap Act. Um, and that is designed to control the collection of information uh, via wired and recorded verbal communications amongst individuals. I would add that it was uh, that it's a wired and recorded uh, verbal, not verbal, I would say oral communications amongst individuals. Um, and uh, the Wiretap Act, of course, applies both in the employment context as well as uh, domestic environments. Um, Cool. So now we've gone over the Constitution. We know that the Wiretap exists. Uh, sorry, the Wiretap Act exists uh, and what it's meant to do in a very broad sort of way. Uh, also, uh, the common law uh, regulates uh, electronic surveillance in that it provides uh, legal protection against electronic surveillance that involves the right to secrecy, seclusion, um, and autonomy. Another really important law. I'm being told to cut the jargon down. Yes, please. If possible. Okay. Not so everybody's a lawyer. Would you, I know. That's why I'm going slow. If you guys, uh, so do you want to do a Q and A? Uh, at the end. And I, I might and, just and be too sophisticated for you guys. I mean. <laughs> this is what I would teach a, a, a class of incoming law students, you know, that don't know the law either. Um, but guys, uh, I, I really, if you guys are not lawyers and you're not, and you want to work on electronic surveillance or you want to create privacy tools, uh, I would just underscore that you have to understand how electronic surveillance works and that you cannot understand how electronic surveillance works unless you actually understand the legal frameworks upon which it's built. So. It's not all about the NSA vacuuming your data, right? It's actually about police using subpoenas and other instruments that I'm describing to get your data that's stored places, right? Um, and for me, just to say, don't store your data in places, I'm not really sure that conveys much. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm just going to keep going. Uh, usually my students fall asleep in class. The good news is I can't really see you guys, right? So I would, you know, consider just placing your head down for a little bit. 
Um, I'm going to go over two more very, very important statutes. Um, And, uh, you know, if I'm definitely going to give license to pseudo to either cut me off or whatever. Um, But again, um, here I am. So a really important law here in the United States is the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. And the Electronic Communications Privacy Act allows federal judges to approve warrants that allow entry into private homes with the intent of placing listening devices to monitor an individual's conversations. The ECPA also allows federal judges to approve uh, uh, requests from third-party digital communication service providers. Uh, to uh, essentially um, compel them to produce data that they have stored. What does that mean? That means that ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, can be used to compel your service provider, whatever that might be, uh, to provide information about you at a very low burden of proof for the government. Oftentimes, um, mounting to relevance. Now, if that seems jargony to you guys, I want to repeat it again, because what I'm saying is that this law permits the government to access your data with a burden of relevance. In other words, the government must only say that the data we are seeking about the pseudonym person is relevant to an open investigation. And almost anything is relevant to an open investigation, specifically wanting to show whether or not the pseudonym person has anything to do with the target of our investigation. So let's say we are investigating, you know, uh, Jaya, right? And let's say uh, we want all of pseudonym's information from AT&T or whatever his service provider is. Um, It would be sufficient for us to say that we want this information because it is relevant to um, um, determining whether or not pseudonym knows Jaya. That should cause a little shock. Hopefully not too much jargon there. All right. So the next really, really, really important statute is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Wait, can I stop Act. You here for a sec- can I stop you here for a second? Sure. Does that mean that surveillance is kind of legal? Or, or not? Or... Surveillance is, if done properly, then it's legal. If surveillance is legal, it's legal. What makes surveillance legal in this context, right? The law called ECPA, right? That says that someone that wishes to get your account information um, has to show a judge, uh, or not even, I, I mean, well, in that case, they have to show a judge, some judicial review, but have to show a judge that getting that account information is relevant to some investigation. And if they pass muster, if they pass that legal threshold, then yes, it's legal. So like I said before, if surveillance is done properly, it's legal, but that doesn't say much. If surveillance is done legally, then it's legal. Also doesn't say much, right? But if surveillance is done per some law, right, uh, then it's legal, absolutely. And that's why you need to understand some of these laws, right? So some of these laws say that the government can collect information that is stored with third parties, like digital service providers, upon uh, very low burdens of proof to a court. And that is based on, um, you know, stuff that we could get into if we had 10 weeks. That answer the question short of? Very much so. Check, check. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act um, is a really, really important statute, just like the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Um, the FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, even uh, lessens the requirements even more for obtaining a surveillance warrant if that surveillance warrant is applicable to foreign intelligence gathering, right? What is foreign intelligence gathering? It is a very broadly defined topic. Um, the, I mean, we can get into this, but it is very easy so long as one party to a communication uh, is a non-U.S. person 
um, to uh, essentially put together a claim that the conversation will result in foreign intelligence gathering. And this is, you know, something that I, we could literally teach 10 weeks about on this one topic of foreign intelligence gathering. However, for now, maybe you should just know that foreign intelligence uh, is an easier burden to meet than, uh, you know, a probable cause of criminality, right? Which is like for domestic sort of spy operations, right? It's uh, naturally easier to violate the uh, rights of others overseas than it is to violate the rights of those within your territory. Uh, and if we wanted to talk about the law, uh, we might say, and I will say, that the Fourth Amendment Amendment of the Constitution does not apply uh, to foreign nationals overseas, and it only applies in its full force to American uh, U.S. persons. Excuse me, U.S. persons, which is defined as uh, uh, folks within. Well, actually, let me clarify: it's only um, applied in its full force um, protecting U.S. persons within the territorial United States. Awesome. Now, guys. Right here at about uh, 31 minutes into our conversation, um, I want you to gear any sort of sleepiness you have or any boredom you've got or whatever. Um, I want you to channel that into complaints that are uh, sort of targeting pseudonym over here. Um, because he was the one that told me that I could not present a slideshow for you guys, just for the record, right? And I got to say, I've got really nice animated slides for all these very boring statutes. Um, and so, you know, I'm just putting the heat and putting this guy on, on, on the heat a little bit because, uh, you know, um, warranted. Okay. So those are the really boring laws that basically absolve us of any privacy rights, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the government. Right. And to summarize, um, basically today in the past half hour, we defined electronic surveillance as the listening and recording of conversations often without the, uh, uh, the conversant's knowledge and we learned that there are a variety of methods for electronic surveillance, uh, such as wiretapping and bugging. Uh, we also discussed various uh, legislation and regulation that are designed to control uh, how electronic surveillance is conducted. And the two really important ones are the three, uh, it's the Constitution of the United States and the uh, ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, and the FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Um, you guys, if anything, if you're trying to build privacy tools, you have to understand how foreign intelligence works because the internet is global and you have to understand how domestic intelligence works. Uh, because ultimately, uh, it may be the case that you're building something that actually is quite easy for the government to surveil, uh, because the threat model includes also a legal threat model, um, or essentially Excuse me, I think I just got cut off. Okay, so pseudo, uh, if we have time, I can go on to the impact of technology on privacy. And in that context, I will talk about cookies very briefly. Um, but it's really up to you. It's going to be more jargon. No, please go ahead and have a say. whole hour. And if you have it's going more... to be all this high level stuff that basically, you know, you ask a law professor to do something, you will get a law professor doing it. Um, okay, so, uh, uh, anyone ever Google their name? I know all the hands are going up. I know that pseudonym Googles his name all the time. That's the only reason I know his name, right? Because he's always Googling it. Um, I wonder when you Googled yourself what you found out, if you found anything out. Um, most people uh, could be a little surprised about the information that you know, that could be obtained over the, uh, the, um, the clear web with a very simple internet search. Uh, maybe not everybody in this room, but most members of the public writ large. Um, and so privacy in this context might be thought of uh, as diminishing as technological, technological innovation uh, progresses, right? And in this context, you might think of privacy as, uh, well, Privacy has so many definitions, right? But uh, two very popular definitions. Uh, one is the right to be left alone and free from surveillance and uh, personal intrusion. And another might be the, at least in the digital context, uh, the right to control uh, your information, right? Uh, and that includes 
controlling who perceives your information, who can copy your information, who can modify your information, and so on, your data, right? Um, so, and in that context, of course, information privacy uh, is just a play on that. It's the right to determine when and to what extent a piece of information about yourself can be communicated to others. Basically, the right to control uh, your data. Um, in this context, because privacy can be interpreted super broad, um, this sort of contributes to the debate about like privacy expectations and the availability of personal information and, and so on, right? Um, and there are a number of issues uh, that are of concern. The first, of course, is electronic surveillance, which we just discussed. Um, and uh, others might include, uh, which I'll cover right now, uh, personal information, um, and the idea of cookies and spyware, um, and uh, something I touched on before, which is workplace monitoring. Um, and that will encapsulate basically the impact of technology on privacy, kind of writ large. 20-minute um, version. Cool? Okay, so um, we've covered electronic surveillance briefly. Um, but all I have to say, actually, to close on electronic surveillance is that you don't have to be a criminal to come in contact with it, as the example that I tried to demonstrate with pseudonym. Um, and basically, uh, we are all very likely to encounter various forms of electronic surveillance uh, throughout the day, um, actually. Uh, right now, as I, if I were standing outside, I'd probably have three cameras on me that I didn't even know existed, for example. Um, this phone call is uh, leaving behind my digital fingerprints uh, to the network provider uh, that I'm signed up with, as well as, uh, oh gosh, Discord, which is one of the worst tools on earth in terms of like actually vacuuming up all of your data and making sure that it's uh, there for the potential law enforcement or onlooker. Um, and so, yeah, we are just bleeding uh, uh, information about ourselves uh, uh, right now. Uh, and, and constantly in bleeding information about ourselves. Um, but what makes this sort of like, what is the bright side of this? Uh, there is very little bright side, but one might say, well, at least the information that you're, you're leaking all this uh, while, while you're on this call uh, is not personal, right? Um, and so that begs the question, what is personal information? Um, so let's say, for example, um, Let's say, for example, um, let's say, for example, you live in a house and then this house next door has just been sold, right? And your new neighbor comes in and it's like a middle aged person who keeps to themselves and doesn't appear to be friendly. Um, they have really odd hours. They come across as super strange. Um, and your attempts to sort of welcome them with pie and cookies and stuff have been have totally failed uh, because this person never answers the door right? Um, you wonder about the person, you might, your mind might get carried away if you're, you know, and, and, and you, you might, uh, or typically you might wish that you had more information to go about, right? So it's, it's this information, right? This personal information about this person that's taking all these precautions to basically uh, remain a recluse, right? That might, that, that we, we are talking about when we talk about personal information. So what would you do if you were the neighbor of this person, right? You probably wouldn't go like to city hall and scour all the documents there. Uh, you probably wouldn't, uh, uh, you know, wait until they throw out their trash and start digging through it. Uh, or tracking down the person's friends or relatives that might have, uh, you know, stopped by the house at some point over the last month while you were, you know, obsessed with this new neighbor that doesn't seem super friendly, right? These are all things that you that you would have to do in the physical world, right, uh, in order to obtain some personal information about this person, in order to discover who they really are beyond, you know, uh, um, um, the very surface level that you are viewing as their neighbor, um, but. Um, think of the same sort of project if you were trying to do this online, right? So if you could spend just a couple minutes, maybe a few minutes, maybe 10 minutes, uh, maybe 30 minutes searching the internet, searching the World Wide Web, uh, there is a much greater chance uh, that um, you would uh, be able to snoop around, right? So if you're given sort of the options, either go to City Hall, dig through everything, dig through this guy's trash, uh, kind of just like put them on 24-hour watch to see who's stopping at the house, essentially do a stakeout, 
right? Um, all of that is so much effort, but in the same context online, it's actually a lot easier, right? It's a lot easier to even try and fail because all you're doing is putting the person's name into a search, right? As, as sort of a starting point. And the point here is basically to say that I, like with information technology, is relatively easy and simple to find personal information on anyone uh, that you wish, including, you know, your brand new neighbor. Um, in uh, the, the, the IT world, the information technology world, uh, much of information about us, about individuals, and, and uh, uh, is, is kept in databases, right? And the databases are uh, essentially uh, uh, housed digital information. Uh, they can house uh, information that is um, um, very uh, personal, right? Uh, information like social security numbers, credit card numbers, medical histories, family histories. Uh, practically every organization that I can think of uh, has a database that's full of information on everyone that they do business with. Uh, and the concern is whether or not they should be collecting this information. Um, um, sorry, the concern is not whether or not they should be collecting the information, um, but what they will do with it, how secure it is, how accurate it is, and who it can be sold to, right? So we all agree that there is at least some information that organizations keep and that they are not violating the law by keeping that information. This kind of goes back to whether or not electronic surveillance is legal, right? Um, but the concern, you know, like, is not just whether or not they should be collecting the information, but it's also what they do with it and how secure it is and how accurate it is and who it can be sold to, right? Um, and personal data in this sense is increasingly being made available online uh, in databases uh, that can be accessed by uh, various uh, search engines. So let's say uh, you knowing this, right? You decide to go on the internet and conduct a web search to basically learn more about your neighbor. Uh, you discover who your neighbor, uh, how old your neighbor is. Uh, you discover their actual exact birth date, uh, their previous address, their employment, all the things, right? You learned. Uh, for example, that they moved from one state to the other after his, uh, their first wife passed away, and you learn that 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 uh, that death was caused by an automobile accident. Right? You can you can find all this information out from the internet. Uh, you learn that they took on a new job as a commercial pilot uh, because you checked into LinkedIn, um, and that is why uh, the, the the neighbor's never home. Right. Uh, which is a lot less scary than thinking that, you know, the guy is basically a mob boss, right? You also discovered how much they paid for their home. You also discovered that they ran a 5K race in 27 minutes and 33 seconds last year, right? So now you're feeling pretty good about your neighbor, right? Um, but uh, the process that made you feel good about your neighbor was, you know, potentially... Um, incredibly sort of invasive to this person's uh, 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 preference, right? Which is probably to keep a private life, right? Um, so the question that concerns people in this context is uh, whether personal information, um, like the kinds that we just discussed, uh, should be so readily available to the public. Right. So it's not just all information, but personal information, um, whether or not that should be available to the public. And uh, the reality is that the availability of personal information uh, shows zero sign of slowing down. Uh, and uh, courts and governments of all levels are increasingly making public records online. Um, there are, for example, just the, uh, the, the, the two or three bankruptcy proceedings that have uh, in crypto. Uh, that we witnessed just over the past two or three months um, have resulted in, um, you know, very surprising to the world, uh, but not to most lawyers, leaks about personal information of all of the predators um, um, related to uh, those bankruptcies, right? So we know that this is a huge, huge problem. Um, So, for instance, yeah, just to sort of like underscore, right, the problem here uh, is that somebody that files for, for, for bankruptcy 
uh, one of the problems is, is obviously the requirements of law, right? And and someone filing for bankruptcy has to disclose their social security number, their banking credit card numbers, their account balances, their children's names and ages, and so on. And in some cases, they have to list their creditors. And in cases where their creditors are customers, right, you, that's when you've got uh, such a big sort of uh, scary spill of information into the world. Um, I will close out this talk uh, in uh, with cookies and spyware, uh, because I know that this is something I, I will get yelled at if I don't mention. Um, but let me try to uh, let me try to describe cookies and or explain cookies and spyware by uh, by uh, with reference to a to a, to a, a hypothetical, right? So let's say um, let's say a pseudonym jumps on the internet from his home, on his home computer, right? And he goes to Amazon.com, right? And he's automatically recognized by Amazon.com. In fact, it, it, the website itself says, "What's up, pseudo?" or "Hello, pseudo," or pseudo's real name on the upper right-hand corner, the web page, right, um, top left. Uh, you can probably uh, click on uh, pseudo's Amazon.com. Takes us to his own personalized page of all these recommended products based on everything that Sudo has purchased in the past. And in fact, based on all of Sudo's past searches as well, right? It's not just what he's, he's browsed upon. Uh, but yeah, how does uh, Amazon know so much about Sudo, right? That's a huge question. You might think, well, he, obviously everybody knows about Sudo. He's so famous and cool and all this stuff, but that's not the case. Nope. The reason Amazon knows so much about Sudo is because of cookies. So websites can easily monitor consumer behavior without any knowledge or any consent, right? Uh, or any meaningful consent. Let me just throw all the sticklers out there. And vendors can track the movements of their consumers uh, it, it, with, with the use of uh, uh, cookies, right? So cookies, in this case, I think you could define as uh, small data files that are written and stored on a hard drive by a website when a user visits the site with a browser. So what is a cookie? Cookie is a small bit of data that's stored on my hard drive. It's stored there and put there by a website um, when I visit um, the website's uh, page um, with a browser, obviously. Um, the cookies, the small bits of data, provide information um, about the pages visited, the items examined, the dates of the visits, and even the passwords that I used in some cases. Uh, the information is stored in the cookie. I think all this cookie, again, that's just a small bit of data. And this is all stored on your hard drive, and then it is sent back to the company. Cool. So again, basically, cookie is a bit of data that's stored on your hard drive, and it's put there by a website, and it is put there by a website along with information about the pages that you visit, the items in those pages that you examine, the dates of your visits, your passwords in some cases, and so on, right? And it's then uploaded right back up to the, uh, uh, the company uh, or the website, essentially. Uh, and basically allows you uh, to, or, or, or the functional uh, sort of result is that you are spying on yourself and providing information to the website that you're visiting. Um, but of course, uh, and that's what a cookie is, right? Even more intrusive than a cookie, even more problematic than a cookie is something called spyware. Um, spyware is... Uh, not a small file, it is a small computer program um, that's stored on the user's hard drive. And what it does is collect the user's habits and transmits those habits uh, to a third party. And all of this happens without the user's consent, right? So one big difference in cookies and spyware is cookies are files where spyware is actual code, right? That's gathering information. Um, it can monitor any website visited by the user, right? Whereas cookies are specific to that particular website. Um, spyware can be installed when you download software, 
Um, oftentimes it's installed when you download freeware or shareware. And a very sort of common way to fall victim to spyware is by downloading peer-to-peer um, -peer, uh, file swapping products, like if you're, if you're on BitTorrent or something. Um, and both computer, both cookies and spyware do this, but I think spyware does it like infinitely more than cookies. Um, it, it is that it it it, it, it steals uh, your your resources on the computer essentially by using up your computer memory, your bandwidth, and so on. Um, and because the spyware uses up so many resources, it can also cause instability on your computer. Right. So um, that's the difference between cookies and spyware. Um, there was a question about the difference between cookies and metadata. I think they're two very, very, very different things. So it really depends on the context. Like we've given cookies a definition, right? It's information on your computer uh, about that basically tracks your activities on a particular website and gets zapped up to the website again. Metadata generally as a, as a definition just means data about data. Right. So if the within the cookie information, for example, it's saying that you uh, it will it, it, it will record, for example, a, a cookie will record the times that you visit your website. Right. That might also be uh, part of uh, the information that your service provider uh, logs as metadata information about what you're doing. Right. Data about data, data about the data that you're receiving. Right. And that data about it is the time that you're receiving the web page. So I go on to Amazon.com at noon and the um, the information in the packets being sent back and forth that reflect the time of my uh, transfer transaction. That's metadata. Sure. Right. But if I then take that data, the, the time noon and then and put it into a Word document and send it to pseudonym and I'm like, hey, check out this file that contains the time of my logging onto Amazon, then in that context, that same exact information would be considered content because it's the primary sort of meat of what it is I want pseudo to read, right? Again, a lot of this is a lot more helpful with slides uh, or with drawings or with even, you know, any type of visual. But uh, my main point there was to say that metadata and content and this distinction is very situational. Uh, it, it's, you could have metadata in what context that is content in another. And oftentimes, actually, those are arguments that we make uh, in efforts to uh, you know, um, uh, argue for privacy of stuff like VPN or even um, uh, encrypted messaging uh, or even um, um, I mean, I could go on forever, like phone using phone cards is the, the, the little pin number that you're dialing. Is that content or metadata? It really matters whether it's content or metadata, because that sort of turns on whether what kind of authority is going to be used to collect it. But again, I will refrain from using jargon and other legal terminology. So very broadly, cookies are data that's stored on your computer by a website and then zap back up to that website. It tracks your movements on a website, your activity on a website, Bioware is a program, not data, resides on your computer and then zaps up information to a website again, but what it can collect is much broader than that of a cookie, right? Um, and it will diminish system resources in a very serious way, um, potentially causing crashes. Um, and then metadata generally is just information about information. So you have a phone call at uh, 2.52 East Coast time, the information about your call, your communication, is that it was taken, it took place at 252. The number that you use to dial, uh, that's even more metadata, right? Because that's information about your communication, data about the data that's actually being transferred, the content of the data is being transferred between me and the other caller. Um, whereas content is just anything that's not metadata. Um, all to say that there are overlapping definitions. You can have a cookie. Uh, that's just metadata, comprised of just metadata, or you have a cookie that's actual content. I would actually argue that the cookie information that's being transmitted to, from your home computer to the website is content and not metadata. Um, but that's really like, I wouldn't, I mean, it's sort of a technicality that I'm not sure 
I'm not really sure the sort of the, the, the usefulness of, of separating things into, in, into those, into that paradigm or into that sort of those categories. And I think actually this wraps up at least this part of my lecture. So we've discussed electronic surveillance, the main mechanisms of electronic surveillance. Uh, we've discussed some jargony laws, some of which are very important. Um, and now we have turned to and discussed information privacy, what it looks like, what it is, the control of, of your, your, your data. Uh, we've looked at the difference between personal privacy, sorry, personal information, non-personal information. Um, we skimmed past uh, sort of the content metadata distinction um, and applied uh, and also talked about cookies and spyware um, and the differences between cookies and spyware and some of the differences slash similarities that might exist between, uh, you know, a, a cookie and metadata and content. I've got like four minutes left. And I'm pretty, yeah. Are you ready for it? Tell me. Go for it. So the question is, specific website like Amazon can read a cookie which is re related only to Amazon and not the other websites? Uh, or is it able to reach other website cookies as well? It's a good question, I think. That's a really, really, really good question. My understanding is that it would only be able to read the cookie from... Uh, well, it depends what we mean by reading the cookie, right? Like if the cookie functions by uh, basically uh, gathering information and then zapping itself back up to the website, then I guess my sort of the missing part here is like, are we saying that cookies from another website will zap themselves up to Amazon or that Amazon is actively looking for other cookies that were generated by other websites? Because if it's doing that, then I would almost venture that what it's doing is more akin to spyware than it is to just a, a regular cookie. I'm, I'm not sure whether uh, whether yeah it does it, it definitely does well I'm not sure whether whether Amazon can access cookies uh, left on your on your computer by other websites but it's um, it's a fact and it's a big problem that that Amazon does leave and also all other websites do um, do leave um, third party cookies on your on your machine so basically right. imagine it uh, as as Amazon leaving um, a um, uh, an advertising company or like one of these data aggregator uh, data broker companies uh, cookie on your uh, on your machine without without you ever visiting the website of that uh, of that company but still being um, like surveilled basically through the cookie that is left on your machine so that is very common practice yeah. and some websites if if you look through the the uh, cookie settings or, or like the the GDPR provided um, uh, like cookie quote unquote opt out um, um, uh, option. Sometimes you find hundreds, like literally hundreds of these gray, nameless, uh, never before seen companies uh, whose cookies are being stored in your machine because you you click accept all because you don't want to go through the, the hassle of, of disabling them one by one. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. So when I say website, um, so websites of the past are not the same as websites of today, right? So websites of the past, right? You could say very basic HTML with no plugins from third parties, et cetera, right? And let's sort of modify that into a modern website where you have, uh, just like any other code, right? You've got, uh, it's basically a, a, a composition of various different code sets and different sites all coming together under the banner of Amazon, right? And so this would probably be Amazon's position. Like, listen, it's not, you're on amazon.com, but really you're visiting 50 different sites, right? Because all these 50 different companies, all these 50 different functionalities are all what come together to produce you know, Amazon. And because we're not like a government entity and there's no real law on this until GDPR, we don't really have to notify you that we are providing you that we are uh, that, that, that we're using these cookies. Right. Some of them might be very basically functional, but a lot of them are trying to target your behavior. Right. And we at Amazon are now employing the services of all these other companies. Right. In order to do that. And so their position would be, well, yeah, sure. Uh, it's not really third, I mean, they're third parties and that they're not Amazon, but we are consulting with them, right? They're part of the Amazon umbrella, at least with respect to, you know, uh, uh, providing the service of the website. It's really interesting, actually, really good question. Um, yeah, and so that's essentially the big giant gaping loophole uh, that you would get not just the very, uh, the, the cookies from the first party that you're visiting, which is in and of itself problematic, but all the phantom type cookies that would just uh, be looped in there. Yeah, yeah. 
really good point. And we have another question from earlier when, when you were talking about the US laws uh, related, related to privacy and how, uh, how surveillance uh, is kind of sort of legal, you know, if it's done legally, as you said. So the question is, um, what about third world countries or Eastern Europe um, or even China regarding the topology of legal frameworks compared to roughly the, the US? Are you familiar with that? I don't see. Um, so what is the question asking? Like roughly, what do I think about uh, law in China for privacy? I understand it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand it as basically like a comparison between uh, uh, between like third world countries, Eastern Eastern Europe, and and, and China uh, versus versus the U, uh, the legal uh, framework in the U.S. So I'm not sure that is a very sort of so. First of all, I'm not an expert on China privacy or Chinese legislation um, on privacy. Uh, I guess what I would urge folks, especially in the the space of like privacy enhancing technologies, to think about is uh, so. It's important to think about the law, obviously, right? But the law is really helpful to your design process and making tools if it like for me i think it's really helpful if i could show you how easy it is for even the united states government or any other sort of what you might consider a sort of like uh, functional democracy that espouses rights amongst people blah 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 right how easy it is for the u.s government to get information uh, and to get almost a complete picture of uh, of, of uh, the way that we interact online, right? So, uh, I I would be hesitant to say, right, that that one is better than the other for that reason. Um, but I think that when if we were to analyze the the sort of like the the surveillance laws of like Germany versus the United States, um, I would actually argue. Uh, that in many ways the United States system is more transparent and has more uh, more 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 um, 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 checks and balances uh, than the German system, but we are just so much better and sophisticated at actual uh, programmatic surveillance that it doesn't matter that it's as it, that it's more transparent, right? Everyone's looking at America and thinking, "Wow, they're vacuuming up all our data," uh, and that's true, right? But it's we do it with a bit more of due process than say Germany. Um, and that's just a fact, right? We're just, we just have great capabilities and that's why it's very scary. Um, so, which is not to say that the process that we give here in the United States to uh, a surveillance warrant is sufficient. I don't think it is, but even then it's still better than a country like Germany. It's actually crazy. Right. Um, so kind of set that to the side, right. That, that that very short discussion and i guess what i'm trying to say is like it doesn't really matter the way that i really think we should be looking at this problem uh is through capability as opposed to uh legal authorization oh, sorry as opposed to legal protections so it's a difference between seeing like wow this state has a technological capability and it has a great amount of authority to conduct surveillance right? I'm not talking about like the way that the state is protecting the people, right? I'm talking about the way that the state is enabling its government to use technology to conduct electronic surveillance. And if you were to scope that for these big, uh, for at least for China and America, you would see that the authorization is pretty, in terms of the capability, right? Both governments have amazing capability, and both governments do not suffer from a lack of authorization. And so what that teaches you, or that teaches me or teaches anybody, that sort of the, 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 the insight there is that if you're designing anti-surveillance software, um, you should not, like your threat model should include the, the, the capabilities of a government without taking into consideration the quote unquote safeguards. Um, because you can't rely on the law to, to protect you but you can rely on the law to let you know how broad the authority is. Does that make sense? Exactly. Absolutely. So that is why that is why the the adversary of NIM is defined as the GPA, which is the Global Passive Adversary, with these capabilities. With so with the capabilities of observing the entire network uh, all at the same time, and that is what we designed our system against. So that's what we protect against for for that specific absolutely. reason. Absolutely. We don't trust that. <clears throat> we can don't I just trust any legal framework. 
Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I totally agree. But I got to say to folks in the audience that think that the uh, that the NIM network only protects against the global passive adversary. That's not true. Actually, we are like the cool thing is, yes, it will protect over the global passive adversary. And it does so without the other without very key vulnerabilities that other uh, um, um privacy networks have right against the global passive adversary but really the real uh, to me the really cool thing about anonymity networks and about the nim network uh is that it will uh obfuscate the uh footprints the digital footprints and fingerprints that you leave behind with all of these third parties as well right and these little third parties that we're talking about whether it's through the, the in, 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 in whether it's like, you know, you're visiting gmail.com, that's a third party right there, right? Like that is a party now that has your IP address, right? But if you're using an anonymity network, right, it now has another IP address. So when the government, not the global passive adversary, but when a small dinky government even serves a subpoena to Google and says, hey, Google, I want information about pseudonym, right? It's also the NIM network's also protecting you in that case. And that case is actually so much more frequent um, than the global passive adversary. Like we have very sophisticated technology that actually can prevent the surveillance uh, or resist surveillance by global passive adversary. But probably like right now, the thing that is keeping you secure that the NIM network might provide to you is from those third parties like Google not being able to out you uh, when the government asks them, you know, like who pseudonym at Gmail is, right? Because they'll just give them the information that they're that they're obligated to give, but those IP addresses will all be bunk IP addresses that won't be actionable. So the NIM network, not only, in my view, again, not only does it protect you from the global passive adversary, which is really really cool, right? Really really great, right? But as a huge 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 value add, in addition to that. Is uh, is that it will protect you from even uh, the, uh, the 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 sort of lack of so the the unsophisticated actor that is uh, you know uh, dependent upon centralized uh, th that's dependent upon uh, you know users leaving their data with centralized actors uh, and technologies like Google. Does that make sense? It does. And for the record, by the way, pseudonym at gmail.com was taken, unfortunately. So I, I have another email address, um, which is I'm really, really sad. I'm glad I took that before you joined. Damn it. <laughs> Dear community, hey guys, do you have I'm, any further I'm questions really sorry. to this guy? Oh, yeah. Sorry about the jargon earlier, guys. I just, like, I'm literally in this mode right now. Um, he wants to sound sophisticated. I think you pulled it off. If I, you to me, if to you me, can't do it, I feel like if you can't do something, you should teach it. And if you can't teach it, you should at least dress like you can teach it. So for me, it's sort of yeah. co some combination of those principles makes me use all the jargon. Yeah, Are you all that's asleep? A good I think for life in general, they're just here. Yeah, for everybody's the sleeping. Participation. Awesome. I'm used to this. Yeah, by the way, just um, imagine this guy giving actual lectures at the university. So imagine having to show up uh, Tuesday morning to his class every it's, week. It's actually a lot more fun when it's visual because, like, I tell a lot of jokes, I move around, do all this stuff, and you know, uh, the, the jargon is somewhat welcome to some extent. You know, are, are you going to flame me again for the for the slideshow? I honestly think that, yeah, I mean, listen, imagine how much more useful this would have been to folks if I could put my slides up. And and listen, you guys, Pseudo knows that my slides are the bomb. Like, they are the best slides. I make really good slides. All right, I'll give you that. Uh, he, he gave us a presentation uh, uh, on our and team you guys have scary the... slides about surveillance. How do you make lines, yeah. straight lines that are, you know, from look like so scary and give people nightmares, right? Turn them into one of my, my slides. Uh, actually, Oheka, it. one of our, our close friends from, from uh, No Trust Verify, is asking whether you have any book recommendations about, about privacy or, or any of the topics discussed. Oh, my God. Uh, yes, I do. I have uh, a lot of recommendations, um, but it really depends what we're looking for. Like, are we looking for... Do we want to discuss... Um, 
sort of privacy with respect to government surveillance? Or do we want to talk about like sort of like theoretical underpinnings of privacy and what it means? Um, but either way, you know, I can do I can generate a short list of books uh, for pseudo to uh, circulate. Please, I'll do that. Cool. So I'll, I'll send the list, guys, on the uh, uh, on the announcements channel in the summary post that I'm going to write uh, on the um, uh, the Shipyard Academy announcements channel. Yeah, and feel free uh, and no trust verify to get in touch directly if you if there's like after I post the list if there's like something that in particular that you would like to read about because um, it's a really big topic, right? But you can find me. I mean, uh, Nickel is saying uh, I know the best. Uh, you know the best one he's saying uh i know the best book read the terms of uh i i know, I know the best book read the terms of service of google apple or facebook which is a pretty good point l-o-l actually. l-o-l yes all right well i think that concludes our um uh lecture number two so Ahmed, unless you have uh, you have any closing words for this uh, lovely community that, that gathered here of uh over 350 people yeah, guys, uh, thank you so much for uh, for being a part of this community, most importantly, um, like seriously. And if you, I, I know that some of this stuff could sound boring, um, but um, I think it is so important for technologists to learn more about the threat model that government surveillance presents um, and, and, and the evolving threat model. So if any like i'm personally dedicated to this cause to like helping technologists understand this so that you guys can build the best tech so if if that if if you know like anything that you need from my end please feel free to reach out to sudo to reach out to me um and we're there for you guys exactly very much so we are dedicated to this cause here at nim um, and by the way, could you could you share some of the slides? Maybe I can I can pass them on to the community, along with the uh, list the of books, is, book um, recommendations. You know, the slides in that case they'd be out of context. That's the whole thing. I mean, that's the thing I worry about now. They, they, but maybe I I'll put one together that's sort of in context. Fine. Yeah, please please do that. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes lecture number two. Huge thanks for coming on, Ahmed. This was magnificent as as always. And um, um you guys should head over to the claim attendance nft channel just straight under the community call text channel uh and you'll find instructions there to claim your pull up for being here live muchas gracias for showing up everybody um see you tomorrow during the community call and uh good luck with uh with your quizzes on saturday have a lovely evening everybody awesome see you guys bye